Today you will start learning what we call graph theory. So this is graph theory. This is a this is a mathematics, uh, just quite different than other mathematics. This is a mathematics quite different than other mathematics we had discussed so far. So at the beginning we had sets and some notions of uh, some notions almost like introducing notation, uh, unions, intersections. And after that we start thinking about um, sequence of uh, statements. So we discuss induction. Uh, induction we'll be using in graph theory as well. Uh, it was an important topic to learn. Um, and then after that we start looking at counting. Okay, So how we can count and we use uh, what we call a product rule and addition rules and we develop some formula, like combinatorics. So we did permutation, combinations. They were essentially counting. Now in graph theory, we will be facing different type of problems, and we'll try to solve them using this gadget. Now this is going to be a topic which we discuss about a month. Okay? So I want to first give you some motivation, because this topic has a lot of definitions. So we talk about vertices, edges, you know, paths, triers, cycles, circuits. There will be so many definitions that if I start like that, I afraid you will be finding it boring. So I will start with three problems. Um, so the first problem, this is Koenigsberg bridge problem. I mean, uh, this is so famous that anytime you see graph theory in any book, you see a Koenigsberg bridge problem with it. And it's supposed to be one of the reasons we have graph theory. Okay? So uh, this is a problem that came up uh, in Perugia, East Perugia. And I'm afraid I don't know the date, but so this is the problem. Let me state the problem, and then I will talk about how the error give a solution to this. So in Königsberg, you had these bridges and some land. Okay. So this is the land. This is a land. This is a land. And you have bridges. You have more here. And here. So this is a land too. So you have all this land. It's almost like an island here. An island here and a semi-island here. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven bridges. Usually called seven bridges of Königsberg. And people were, this is where the river is. People were taking like Sunday strolls on this area. They were passing by bridges and so on. So they were like taking strolls using these bridges. Okay. So somebody came up with this question, almost like a joke at the time, but uh, somebody said, can you stroll this area so that you pass all the bridges, but only once? Can you stroll, stroll in this area to uh, pass by passing uh, so that 
we pass every bridge uh, once and exactly once. This was the question. This, I think, came to Erdar in a letter. And Erdar uh, thought about this. And he took a completely different approach. Like anybody who's faced this problem will probably will argue by cases. They say, I can go this way, I can go this way, and so on. But he took a completely radical approach. And he basically discovered a mathematics which leads to solutions to any questions like this. So it's so powerful mathematics that you can use it for any other type of network problems. Okay. So what he, he did, which is what graph theory came out, is that he said the locations that you're at are like dots. You can sort of think them as like status. So you could be either here or on the island, or here, or on this side. So you can even call them names. So he basically denoted this where you can be without passing bridges as just vertices and just dots. So now they, nowadays they're called vertices. And then he said uh, all the bridges, all the ways to pass from vertices to vertices are actually just edges. So if you think this as A, this is B, this is C, this is D, you have two ways to pass from A to B, so you have two edges. And from B to C, you also have two. From D to A, D to C, you have one. And from D to B, you have one. So you have seven edges. Okay, that's seven bridges of Königsberg. became seven edges with four vertices. He calls them edges and vertices. This is actually a multigraph now. We, we call it multigraph later. But So he, he started grafting like this. And he came up with this very clever idea. I mean, you can say. But he said, uh, if you have a, so the question becomes this, in terms of graph theory. Is there, a, nowadays this is called a path, or a, actually a circuit. If you want to come back to where you started, uh, such that on this on this graph so that every edge appears once and only once. So this becomes the question. So you can try to form things like this, like you can start from C you can say, I want to go like this, like this. You can say, I want to go like this, say like this. You can say, I, I want to come back like this, go here, go here. But you see that you get stuck. You're ex actually short of only one edge, but you get stuck somewhere. You, you never can complete the whole thing unless you just go from some edge twice. For example, you could, you could use this edge twice and go back here if you, if you... If you were allowed to pass any edge twice, then you can do it. But if you're not allowed, you can try, 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 and it doesn't work. So what... Uh, you need to do is to say why you can do it. Okay. So what uh, Erda did to basically to answer this question, uh, aside from discovering that you can actually draw these things, these are called graphs. 
aside from discovering that you can attack these problems, convert them into these graph questions, he also discovered that you can give an explicit solution by introducing something called degree, which we will properly study. But degree of a vertex is basically number of edges that are connected to the vertex. It's the number of edges that are connected. And then he proved this theorem. This is by Eure. These circuits, usually called Eure circuits, this is called the Eure circuit. On a graph, on a connected graph, we will learn what connected means. But, uh, there's an Euler circuit. Circuit. If and only if he found exact condition. Anybody wants to guess what it is or any idea? It's a very simple condition actually. Think about it. And let me say that circuit, I mean, this you can ask for a general, but circle means you have to end where you started. You can generalize this to a walk, which I will explain what it is, but at this point, circuit means you have to end up where you started it. So with the circuit condition, what would you say the condition is? Suppose I'm here, I start, walk to another edge, to another edge, to another edge, and all the edges, and finish and come back here. And I finish all the edges. And I went all the vertices. What will happen? Like, especially in terms of degrees. Uh -huh. Is it something like only maximum of two vertices can have uh, odd number of? That's for the walk, yes. That's true. If you don't have to be where you started, that's exactly, that's true. If you want circuit, then uh, actually not. They're all even, okay? So all the degrees, uh, degree of, uh, all the degrees of vertices, of vertices are even. It's a very simple criteria, which explains exactly what you need. Degrees of vertices are even. So, I mean, you can even come up with this, but uh, what the power of this, of course, what he earlier did was he come up with graph theory, and then you have much more advanced theorems now in graph theory. Not only this, but some other more, more difficult questions. So I will do this. Maybe to, like in, in a couple of hours, we'll do this. And we'll prove it why this is true. To, to do this, I have to talk about connected graphs, which you need to use something called equivalence classes. We have to talk about uh, the language, walk, circuit. Uh, there's cycles and paths and so on. So you have to learn the language a little bit. But other than that, as you so this is an easy thing to see. So this is one of the problems and one of the solutions that graph theory deals with. Let me explain another question. The second question that you can sort of discuss is the map coloring problem. So suppose you have a map. It could be a word map. It could be a, some sort of cycle, like 
doesn't have to be actually uh, map belongs to some countries, small regions. It could be any anything you draw, but it's a map. So suppose you have a map. So map means you have some countries with borders. Okay, this is. But you also uh, require a little bit condition. The condition is that uh, you don't want countries to have borders like this. So you want borders at least to be a little bit line segment. Okay. So a map means uh, you have countries and borders. Uh, borders between them. We say two countries are neighbor to each other. If they have more than a point as a common border. As a common border. Now, this is your condition. So you're not allowed to have just one point. You need at least some sort of country border like that. Now, beware that this is not country. So you could have very different border structures. Like you could, you could have countries like this. Or even just by this, I think it's a kind of crazy thing. So you have to take into consideration many different configurations, okay? And just anything is possible. So the question is, this is called the four coloring problem, four, four color or map coloring problem. What is the smallest number of number of colors that you need? to color a map so that, I mean, this so that part, you don't even probably have to say it because this is what you mean by coloring a map. Neighbor countries does not get the same color. So this is, this is actually a uh, research level difficulty problem. The, I won't be able to give you a solution to this. But let's think about what can be happening here. Can you color a map with only two colors? I can easily draw maps which two colors won't be enough, right? So for example, I can uh, this one I could color with two colors. Two colors would be enough, right? All the neighbors are different colors. But if I had this one, two colors won't be enough. Because if I have A here, B here, here I cannot use A or B. I have to use C. Okay? So if you have a map, uh, just like that, you can use two colors. That means we are talking about these three colors. You may say, I can do this so much that this will increase to infinity. 
Does it going to increase it to infinity if I take more lines like this? No, because I can actually flip. So, can you think of a graph where three colors will not be enough? Can you draw a graph or tell me if there is a graph? Three will not be enough. Or you can actually put it inside too. I mean, it's the same thing, right? So if you use a, uh, I guess in the B, you have to use C, but you have to use D here. So that's what, I mean, that sort of indication. But. So you cannot graph, you cannot color any, any map using three. Three is not enough. That put us in four. Since I wrote it at four coloring, you can guess four is special. So the conjecture, the what believed is, four is enough for any graph. There is actually a proof for this too. So the answer to this question is four is enough that any graph can be colored with four color. So this is uh, Alpen and Hakan theorem. This we cannot discuss. Uh, four, four colors is enough to color a map. Uh, during these lectures, you will learn six is enough. If you go to graduate school, or if you want to study graph theory books, even now you can probably understand the proof. You can prove five is enough. But the proof that four is enough is, uh, I guess, 20,000 pages. And it's done by a computer. This is one of the computer proofs. Only a computer proof exists. So what they did, they classified all configurations possible and then they feed these possibilities into a computer and ask computers to check this. And the computer was able to check all of them and say this is possible, that you can color it with four colors. But the computer check is too long for a human to check in his lifetime. So no human can check the proof. And there is a big discussion if it's still a correct proof or not. Because if a human cannot check a proof, is it still a proof? Because algorithmic proofs, it could bear a problem in it. Maybe some of the cases are not covered well enough. So do we trust the computer mind? This is one of the discussions or interesting historical problems. It's called four color problem. What's interesting for us is that what comes out of this is called planar graphs. So planar graph, as you will see, is about graphs on the plane. Why it's interesting or why, why it's related to map coloring, you can Put the countries as vertices and try to solve the coloring problem. Okay? So now the vertices are countries. So if you want to study the map coloring problem in using graph theory and using the fact that vertices are countries, you see that uh, you can declare an edge between two vertex if they're neighbor to each other, and not put anything if they're not. So you can have many graphs like this, 
like this, for example. You could have a graph like that. Okay. So we can actually draw a graph like this, for example, for this one. It just says, you see that. Like you can sort of have many edges. Uh, this is possible configuration. So you can find graphs like this. And then the question becomes, uh, so these edges are, edges are boundaries. boundaries. So the question becomes, can you call the vertices of a graph uh, using four colors? so that there is no edges between two vertices which have the same color. So you can ask this question. Uh, given a graph, given a graph, what is the smallest, smallest number of colors colors that we need to use to color its vertices so that no two vertex with the same color are with the same color are connected by an edge. So this is a question, of course, but the answer is usually if is a graph, this number called number is called chromatic number. Chromatic number. and denoted by chromatic numbers. So it's a number, integer, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, whatever. Some graphs will have only one. Like if it's a discrete graph, you just need one. So uh, you're asking here if chromatic number is 4, for the graphs that comes from a map. It turns out that I have to say that phrase that for the for the graphs that comes from a map, because I can. It turns out I can draw a graph whose chromatic number is any given integer. So I can make a graph with five chromatic numbers. So anyone who wants to draw a graph where you have five edges or if, like you need five colors to graph it and to color it. Like four will not be enough. So it turns out, let me draw it. I mean, this is the introduction, just to warm up. We'll, we'll come to more serious thing later. This graph, which is possible because you can have an edge between any two vertices, totally 10 edges. This graph will have exactly chromatic number 5. If you have this, chromatic number of this graph is 5. So you will need 5 colors. Why? Because if you use any, any two edges, same color, uh, any two vertices, you have an edge between them. So you, you cannot use the same color. This is called a complete graph with five vertices. Actually, you can do them for any n, k5. This is called k5. And in general, you can do kn. So it turns out that it's possible to find graphs with n vertices, uh, chromatic number n, which tells me then these things has to be special. 
some way. They, they have to be special. So what's special about this that you don't have in K5? Huh? Yes, exactly. So here, if I try to draw it without crossings, I get stuck. I have to do at least one crossing. So you cannot draw it without any crossings. Whereas these things, by the way they are stated, these will not have any crossings. These are borders. So these are called planar graphs. So a planar graph uh, is a graph. Graph which is uh, which has no crossings, edge crossings, when it is drawn on a page, on a page. So graphs that come from maps doesn't have crossings. And because of that, the Alperin theorem, what they prove is that chromatic number of any graph is 4 if comma is planar. So they say that planar graphs have chromatic number 4. Okay. In the backwards also you can say k5 or kn or n bigger than 5 is not planar. You cannot draw that. You can use it that way too. So this is the second problem. Um, so we'll discuss planar graphs after other circuits. So we'll have a whole, uh, probably a week on other circuits, and then a week on planar graphs. With planar graphs, we, we have a lot of inequalities that involves the degrees of the vertices. So you can sort of find inequalities and restrictions on these basic graph invariants. So basic graph invariant means it's a number or it's something you obtain from your graph that doesn't change if you draw it differently. Okay. So we'll discuss how the graph invariants come up. Now if we have time. Third problem. This is the one I like quite a bit. This is actually what I do in research. So it's interesting that way. This is about platonic solids. <coughs> so it comes all the way back to Platon. So a solid is something that um, It's a convex subset of R3. Uh, but I'll just draw pictures. We don't need to know a lot of mathematics to understand. So in terms of pictures, we all know this shape called tetrahedron. This is the one that has four faces, four triangles. They come together to give you something. This is not a pyramid. Usually pyramids have this base, right? Triangle base. So this is, uh, uh, this is not what I'm talking about, okay? This is this one. But uh, you can put two usual pyramids to form this shape. This is called the uh, octahedron. It has eight faces, eight triangles. This is tetrahedron and octahedron. A little boring, but as important is cube. You can do a cube and like this. Uh, 
this is cube. There are two more shapes uh, which are called platonic solids. So let me say what that is first. So a platonic solid is a solid obtained by uh, gluing together angons. Okay, these are triangles, these are squares. You can actually glue together petrodrum like this. Five angle things. It's hard to draw, but there's one solid like this. But you can use uh, pentagons, okay? So the rule for the platonic solids are that you use angons to glue together, but you can only use the same sides, angons with the same number of sides. So you can only use triangles. If you start with a triangle, you have to use only triangles. So these are solids obtained by, by gluing, gluing angons for some man we don't know. Also there is a rule that the gluing should happen in such a way that on each vertex you have exactly the same number of angons meeting. So here I use triangles, but I also have, in each vertex, three of them meets. Three of them meets, three of them meets. So that number, M, is also fixed. Where at each vertex, M and gone, gone meet. So this is 3, 3, by about 3. Here you have triangles, so these are n is 3, but on each vertex there are four things meeting. So it's 4, so m is 4 here. So it's 3, 4. Here it is n is 4, and m is 3. So this is 4, 3. Now, I couldn't draw this, but we have 5 and 3. And we have an icosahedron, which have triangles meeting with 5 things. So these are 3, 5, and 5, 3. Uh, maybe I'll find them some point for you just show you what they I have them in my office actually because you, you can study symmetries of these things so you can do algebraic topology like high level topology using these things but what the theorem is you have exactly five of them if you have a fixed n and fixed m you have exactly five of them you cannot draw a sixth one okay that's the theorem and it's actually were guessed and believed since the Greek times, but why only five of them possible? It should be a very difficult proof, right? I mean, you don't even know how to prove it. You cannot take integrals, derivatives. I mean, this is it's kind of a, how do you know there are five of them and how do you prove it, right? It's a very sophisticated geometric and stuff. It turns out that no, it's not about geometry, it's about graph theory. But you need to be very, very clever about what kind of graph theory. So what you can do, so this is the theorem. There are exactly five. Five platonic solids. And I, can, I will be able to prove this at the end of this course. Like after two weeks, we'll be able to prove this. And the proof is, I mean, it's, anybody wants to guess how this can go into graph theory? Some of you maybe seen this before. Do you know how to convert these things into graphs? Any 
any guess? Actually. Yes, you, you just project it from somewhere into a plane. So I think this like, put a triangle like this, and then project it to a plane. Okay? So project it using one of the faces, one of these triangles. What would you get is a triangle with a triangle inside. So you get this yeah, with a triangle inside. This is what you get from a tetrahedron. For cube, you get this. This is actually sometimes drawn to explain uh, four dimensional cubes, like higher dimensional cubes. So, this is what you get if you do it for the cube. Okay. So, now you have tetrahedron, cube, and so on. So, each of them becomes a planar graph. So each of them becomes planar graph. I mean, I will spend, uh, as I said, a couple of hours with these planar graphs. But uh, what we will see later, that this planar graphs has so I, this marvelous, beautiful formula that number of vertices minus number of edges plus number of faces, number of faces, is always constant, and always same, whatever the graph is, doesn't matter. For example, here you have one, two, three, four vertices, one, two, three, four, five, six edges, and one, two, three, and outside is also counted as a face, four faces. It turns out that this number is eight minus six is two. It turns out it's same here too. If you look, count the vertices, the edge vertices, count the edges, you get 12 edges, count the number of faces, you have 6. You get 14 minus 12, you get 2 again. So that 2 is constant, it's fixed. It's called the Euler number. But this is also some number that you can directly calculate using these shapes. It turns out that this is actually topology, algebraic topology deals with this. The reason they're all the same, they're sort of they're all a, a sphere. They're all a sphere because of that this number is fixed for all of them. So this is, a, this is what you use, okay? You use this to prove that you can only have five n pairs, only five n pairs satisfying this equation. You just write an M, like an M will be these things. So you, you will be looking at planar graphs where you have exactly degree three. So degrees will be all three. Here degree is three, but these things four. So we will be looking at this an M, and then we'll see that there are only five pairs that satisfy this equation. So this will be the proof. And we'll use graph theory to prove it. OK, these are the three problems. And there are, of course, plenty of other questions. There is a, is any of you took graph theory? Any, any, any graph theory you, you took before? Uh, there is a one problem that you may find more engineering-like. Uh, these are more abstract questions, but I, I still like them. The more engineering-like will be finding the minimal spanning subtree. So we'll be looking at a big graph, and now we'll find a tree in it, which means we'll discuss trees also. This is an important part of this course. Trees means these things. 
uh, that doesn't have loops. Okay. So when we learn the language, we'll say graphs which doesn't have uh, cycles will be trees. So we'll discuss trees, and when we are discussing trees. We'll study this minimal spanning subtree problem, where you have a graph. It could be like one of these graphs we just drew. Um, let's see. You have a graph. So we'll be trying to find. Uh, it will be also a weighted graph. So some some costs will be attached to going from one place to other place. So these are called weighted graphs. And this is more like engineering like because in real life you have a cost of say transportation between nodes. So there will be cost of like weights attached to edges. And we will try to find uh, subgraphs which doesn't have any cycles. So we'll be looking for say this is a subgraph which has you can reach to any of these things. Say so this is a sub. I didn't use all the edges. I only used some of them, but I was able to connect all of the vertices to each other. Searching can be written to huh? Searching. So uh, we will develop algorithms to find these minimal subtrees. So I don't know if this is called searching, but we'll have algorithms to find these subgraphs. And there will be grid algorithm and so on. They will, they will have names, and we'll discuss that. I know there are some uh, other things, like about Hamilton cycles and so on. In the past, I wasn't able to go further than this. I mean, this is like pretty much how much I did last couple of years. But if we have time, we can look at more applications. But Just to say something popular, I mean, this, these things became more attractive mathematics recently because we have now big, huge networks, like right? uh, Facebook, for example, how people are connected to each other. If people are friends with each other, there's an edge between them. Each person is a vertex. So you have uh, what you call social media graphs. Like, you have graphs which, uh, you can form with any relation between people. For example, in mathematics, we form these graphs uh, where if two people had a joint paper, you put an edge between them. So you can talk about graphs where people are connected if they have a joint paper. So there is something called Erdős number. You, your distance to Erdős is your Erdős number. So Erdős, actually. So there's stuff like that, which many different branches have their own graphs, and they, can st they, they want to have questions about these graphs. They want to know. There's something called uh, popular books, Six Degrees of Separation, which says that any random two people connected by minimum six edges to each other. Like in Facebook, any of you will have probably a path with friends, 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 that connects you with six people. It's called six degrees of separation. They, somebody claimed this, and they have lots of papers on it that you can actually connect any people with maximum six people. But this is for a connected graph, too. Sometimes you may not be connected. So what we'll do, we will start with the basic language of graph theory, connected graphs, and so on. But we'll do this. Starting second hour. Okay. Take a break.